Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I had an abrupt graduation, and when I say abrupt graduation, what I mean is I flunked college without graduating. Uh, it was 1987. I was a journalism student at the Polytechnic of Central London. But one day I got a telephone call asking me to become the keyboard player in the Frank Sidebottom O Blimey Big Band. So I immediately went into college and told my lecturer I was quitting and I moved to Manchester. So I had no idea what a commencement speech entails. This is how the great American writer George Saunders describes commencement speeches. Some old fart, his best years behind him, who, over the course of his life, has made a series of dreadful mistakes, that would be me, gives heartfelt advice to a group of young, shining, energetic people with all of their best years ahead of them, that would be you. I was glad for that description because I was hoping to bore on about my life lessons. I have made dreadful mistakes, but I used to be like you, young, <laughs> beautiful, and Frank Sidebottom's keyboard player. <laughs> Nothing makes a young man feel more alive and on an adventure than speeding down a motorway at 2 a.m. next to a man wearing a big fake head. <laughs> I was 20 and two years out of Cardiff, where I'd been bullied every day, stripped and blindfolded, and thrown into lakes. On reflection, it was exactly the sort of childhood a journalist ought to have. Forced to the margins, identifying with the put-upon, mistrustful of the powerful, and unwelcome by them anyway. And that's why I loved Frank Sidebottom. I loved his outsiderness, the wonderful, marginal strangeness of it all. We were on the margins together. Frank Sidebottom wasn't the only outsider artist on the Northwest's 1980s avant-garde comedy music circuit. There was Edward Barton, a quiet, bearded man who'd stand on stage and scream, I've got no chicken, but I've got five wooden chairs. <laughs> he kept his belongings in a tiny satchel. He travelled home with us one night, and we dropped him off in the early hours in his neighbourhood, Hume, a desolate housing estate near the city centre. We opened the van door to let him out. As he climbed down with his satchel clutched to his chest, the clasp broke and it opened and all his possessions fell out onto the floor. We drove off, but I kept looking at him from the back window. He made no attempt to bend over and pick up his belongings. He just stood there, his head bowed, staring at the scattered debris. It seemed like I was watching a man at exactly the moment he had reached his nadir. I was confused. From where I stood, Edward Barton was living the dream. He was a fixture on the circuit. I felt a sudden flash of alarm. Was this not enough? Should I be aiming higher? <laughs> and then Frank fired me for tax reasons. <laughs> he stood up in court. He owed 30,000 pounds back tax. And the judge said, this is a very serious matter. Do you have a payment plan? And he said, would a pound a week suffice, my lud? <laughs> and the judge said, no, it would not. And so I moved back to London and I started presenting a terrible BBC Two television show nobody remembers called The Ronson Mission. One day early on, I was sitting in the corner of the editing suite watching the producer work on an interview I'd done in Bournemouth with a conservative town councillor. For most of the interview, she'd been perfectly nice. But at times, when irritated by my questioning, she'd become screechy. In the editing suite, they were carefully stitching together her screechiest moments <laughs> while leaving the nice ordinariness on the cutting room floor. I watched this black magic. Is this bad? I said. The producer gave me a patient look. Think of it this way, John, he explained. One interviewee suffers, but millions are entertained. <laughs> I grinned nervously. He was right. This was okay. She was a Tory <sighs> councillor. We were in the tradition of the great caricaturists like Hogarth, and history proved us to be pioneers. The approach we adopted with the town councillor became fashionable. 
journalists in magazines and newspapers and on radio and TV would take the furthest reaches of their interviewees' personalities, the hysteria, the pomposity, the passive aggression, the delusions of grandeur, anything that made them abnormal, and stitch them together to ridicule them while leaving the normal stuff on the floor. We were reducing people to their flaws, to their outermost aspects. I did it to Tory grandees, white supremacists, anti-Semites, Islamic militants, and then conspiracy theorists, psychics, and eventually hippies. We didn't think hard about what we were doing. We did it because people liked it. The more we did it, the more successful we were. But I think if we had thought hard about what we were doing, we'd have realized we were creating a more conformist, conservative age. We were saying, look, we're normal. This is the average. We were defining the boundaries of normality by harshly judging the people outside of it. Most of us did it instinctively, but when I was writing my book, The Psychopath Test, I met a repentant former researcher for the kinds of daytime TV shows where families mired in drama and tragedy yell at each other. She told me she had a secret trick she utilized when booking the guests. I'd ask them what medication they were on, she told me. They'd give me a list. Then I'd go to a medical website to see what they were for. And I'd assess if they were too mad to come onto the show or just mad enough. What constituted too mad, I asked. Schizophrenia, she said. Schizophrenia was a no-no. So were psychotic episodes. If they're on lithium for psychosis, we probably wouldn't have had them on. We wouldn't want them to come on and then go off and kill themselves. Although if the story was awesome, and by awesome, I mean a far-reaching mega family argument that's going to make a really charged show, they'd have to be pretty mad to be stopped. So what constituted just mad enough, I asked. Prozac, she said. Prozac's the perfect drug. They're upset. I say, why are you upset? I'm upset because my husband's cheating on me, so I went to the doctor and he gave me Prozac. Perfect. I know she's not that depressed, but she's depressed enough to go to a doctor, so she's probably angry and upset. But it wasn't just journalists and TV people marginalizing and ridiculing people on the outside of normality. It was all of us. Even though we see ourselves as nonconformists, individualists, defenders of people's rights to be different, we do it every day on Twitter. I want to tell a story about one of those times. It happened not long ago. It started when I turned on Twitter and I saw that another John Ronson was tweeting, using my photograph as his avatar. Going home, he tweeted. Got to get the recipe for a huge plate of muscle in a bap with mayonnaise, hashtag foodie. <laughs> Who are you? I tweeted him. Making an unhealthy portion of bell pepper and tangerine in a bap with mint, hashtag yummy, he tweeted. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> the following morning, I checked the other John Ronson's Twitter feeds before I checked my own. In the night, he tweeted, I'm dreaming something about time and cock. <laughs> he had 20 followers. Some were people I knew from real life. <laughs> who were probably wondering why I'd suddenly become so passionate about fusion cooking <laughs> and candid about dreaming about cock. <laughs> I did some digging and I discovered that it was a spam bot created by an academic called Luke Robert Mason. I emailed to ask him to take it down. We prefer the term infomorph to spam bot, he wrote back. But it's taken my identity, I wrote. The infomorph isn't taking your identity. It is repurposing social media data into an infomorphic aesthetic, he wrote back. <laughs> I felt a tightness in my chest. I was at war with a robot version of myself. A month passed. The other John Ronson was tweeting about his dinner parties 50 times a day. <laughs> I wrote to Luke that if he wouldn't take it down, maybe we should meet and I could film the encounter and put it on YouTube. He agreed and turned up with two other men. They were all academics who'd met at the University of Warwick. And I've got a short clip from our <coughs> meeting. 
Are no. you going to ring up the London phone book and insist that all the people who have the same name change their, their listings to, yeah. you know, no. there's, there's no. something... No, 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 that, well, because they didn't choose to call themselves John Ronson because of me. Yeah, but, You're choosing to call this John I, Ronson because I, of me. You seem to be saying there is only one John Ronson and I'm the real John Ronson. You're, you're kind of proposing yourself as the real McCoy, as it were, and you want to maintain that authenticity. And I think we feel annoyed with you because we're not quite persuaded by that. We, we get the feeling that you're not so much saying I want to maintain my integrity and authenticity as the real John Ronson. We think there's already a, a layer of artifice there. And that what you're saying is that it's your online personality, the, the brand John Ronson, that you're trying to protect. Yeah? No, it's just me. I mean, tweeting. it's not you. No, you're you. We've met you now, today. We're meeting face to face, person to person. The, the internet is not the real world. Yeah, but I write my tweets and then I press send. Mm -hmm. So it's me on Twitter. That's think, not academic. That's like... I think to take it back to where it came from. It's not postmodern. <laughs> it's just the fact of it. This is bizarre. I, f I find it really, really strange the way you're approaching it. Um, you must be one of the very few people I've ever come across who's chosen to come on Twitter and use their own name as their Twitter name. I don't really know anyone who does that. And that's why I'm a little suspicious of your motives here, John, because that's why I say I think you're using it as brand management. That's why you're using your own name. You know what? I have, never, I have never used the term brand management in my life. <laughs> I've never used that phrase in my life. But I, you, I just get the sense the whole of, different, why that, would you use your own name? You come I, from a whole different bizarre. language to me. These words that you use are a completely different language. Uh -huh. And that's the same about this spam bot. Its language is completely different to mine. Yeah, mm. yeah. 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 yeah, definitely. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, that's what's annoying me so much. It's like a misrepresentation of You'd me. like it to be more like you. No, I'd like it to not exist. Ah, that's, that's bizarre. Then I'd like it to not exist. Yeah. yeah. Why? Because I, I don't know. I find something quite psychologically interesting about that. Why? Um, you know, there's a kind of interesting, kind of uncanny sense of. I, I don't know. I find that quite aggressive almost. Like you'd like to kill these algorithms. Then you must feel threatened in some way. So I, I imagine like, you talking about infomorphs and reality discourses while having one of your dinner parties that your John underscore Ronson's always going on about eating your wasabi dumplings. And I would walk past that dinner party and I'd think, God, that's a bit Nathan Barley. Yeah, I can't imagine doing that either. I'm, but no. that's the world that you're presenting to me. Uh, it's fiction. After the interview, I staggered out into the London afternoon. I dreaded uploading the footage because I'd been so screechy. I steeled myself for comments mocking my screechiness and I posted it. I left it 10 minutes. Then, with some apprehension, I had a look. This is identity theft, read the first comment I saw. They should respect John's personal liberty by stopping directly or indirectly impersonating him or face prosecution. Wow. I thought cautiously. These people are manipulative idiots, read the Knox comment. Sue them, break them, destroy them. <laughs> I was feeling giddy with joy. <laughs> I was brave heart, striding through a field, at first alone, and then it becomes clear that hundreds are marching behind me. Vile, disturbing fools playing with someone else's life and then laughing at the victim's hurt and anger, read the next comment. I nodded soberly. They deserve to die painfully, <laughs> read the next comment. Fire them. Let's get them fired. I was victorious. They took down the spam bot, but it left me feeling uneasy. Had we become the people in the lithographs being ribald at whippings? Fury at the terribleness of other people has started consuming Twitter a lot, and our rage seems increasingly in disproportion to whatever stupid thing some celebrity has said. 
It isn't satire, it's punishment. It's like we're drifting into a new way of being. In fact, it started to feel weird and empty when there isn't anyone to be furious about. Whole careers are being ruined by one mistake. A transgression is revealed. Our outrage at it has the force of a hurricane. And then we all quickly forget about it and we move on to the next one. And it doesn't cross our minds to wonder if the shamed person is okay or in ruins. We're just enjoying the rush of being united and being better than other people. We shame and we get shamed. Some poorly worded political opinion or unwise joke opens the gates of hell upon us. We're like corporations that have committed PR disasters. We have to learn to do damage limitation. It's very stressful. One night in the midst of this, I stood wearing a tuxedo outside a five-star hotel on Park Lane. Downstairs in the banqueting hall, I had just not won a radio award. And so I'd gone out for air and spotted another non-winner, the radio presenter, Adam Buxton. He was leaning against some railings. We watched the limousines speed down Park Lane, the winners spilling out of the hotel in their tuxedos. You know why we always lose? Adam suddenly said to me. I shook my head. Don't you see, he said, you and me, we're marginal. I looked at him. The things we like, Adam said, they're marginal. You're right, I said, my eyes widening. We are marginal. I felt a great weight lifting. I'd spent years frantically reaching for the mainstream, but I didn't have to. It was fine. I was marginal. I could still tell those stories, but they could do something different. They could dehumiliate. They could dignify. So you may be wondering, what have all these experiences taught me? I suppose what I'd like to say is this. Being marginal is fine. It's where the most interesting stuff is happening. Be kind to people. Don't pile onto them on Twitter. We're all lost at sea, clutching hold of driftwood to try and make it through, trapped inside our own bubbles. And a public shaming is like a distorting mirror at a fun fair, taking human nature and making it look monstrous. This is where I am after nearly 30 years of non-fiction writing. And I remember something Chris Seavey, the man under the Frank Sidebottom head, once said to me. It was late one night and we were in the van reminiscing about a show we'd played a few weeks earlier at JB's nightclub in Dudley in the West Midlands. It was very poorly attended. There can't have been more than 15 people in the audience. One of them produced a ball. The audience split into teams and, ignoring us, played a game. <laughs> in the van, Chris smiled wistfully. That Dudley gig, he said. Uh-huh, I said. Best show we ever played, he said. There's something in your writing that is almost kind of Brechtian in the sense that you try and close the gap between yourself and the reader because you put yourself into the process. You describe your journalistic mm. process and you open up your vulnerabilities. So you get away from the idea, I'm a journalist, the holder of objective truth and wisdom. Yeah. You know, you, you put yourself in it. Yeah. But of course, one argument would be, well, what you do is you kind of shift the line, but it's still the line that you draw. It's still the, play, it's still the portrayal of yourself in that. It's not total transparent. There's lots of things you the don't... Brand John Ronson. Yeah, no, exactly. No, in a way, I'm kind of empathising with those people. And, and I kind of, you know, that, that, that is the case, isn't it? That, that you're not really disclosing yourself. You're just choosing to, to, to have a different kind of portrayal. Sure, I'm the one with the final words because I'm, I'm the person who's writing or editing and so on. But I really believe that the more one gets to the core of one's true vulnerabilities and weaknesses... It's like you can't fake it. It's like if you, if I'm doing... But can't you think? I mean, that's what I'm interested in. Isn't, in, uh, isn't arguably, isn't a notion of authenticity itself mm -hmm. a ploy? And then if you think the politicians, for example, those politicians who claim to be authentic, the kind of Boris Johnson's mm -hmm. of this world, yes. you know, to what extent is this genuine authenticity or this is just Boris Johnson's way yeah. of being a clever politician? Well, the fact that we're all deeply suspicious of Boris Johnson's authenticity, <laughs> I believe, proves my point, that people can spot when you're not being authentic. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say I reveal every single thing about myself. I mean, there's some things that are too painful to reveal. And, of course, I mean, I gave up writing my Guardian column years ago because I, I couldn't write about my family anymore. And that was, like, way too exposing and, and a mistake, and I should never have done it. But, no, I think, I think if I'm doing a sort of fake version of myself, 
the reader will know immediately. Mm. Yeah. What do you think is the secret? Is it that? Is it this vulnerability, authenticity? What is the secret of your capacity to generate fondness in other people? <laughs> I, I'm not. I'll, I'm def, I, I'm very empathetic. I think I'm kind of. You know, I'm, I'm very empathetic for the people I write about. So I'm. You know, I'm, I'm kind. It's really rare. I can only think of three stories in my entire life when I've, you know, really sort of been in battle with the person I'm writing about, and it ended horribly. You know, 99% of the time, I find something to. You know, I'm a, I'm a humanist in the, you know, in the humane sense of the word. So that would be, if, if we were summing up your commencement in four words, it would be, be nice, it works. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I think, and when you notice it, you know, when you notice that we're living in this kind of hierarchical situation where basically we gain strength from, from other people's destruction, when you really start to notice it, you realise how often it happens. Mm. And when you opt out of it, nothing bad happens. Mm. You know, it's, it's, in fact, it's a sort of, you know, it's a better life.